these activities go which will be given in English. It's organized by the Association of Cardiology, a new concept in the assessment of aortic valve stenosis. My name is Carlos. I will co-chair this activity with Professor Ricardo Ronderos, former president of the Argentine Federation of Cardiology, and one of the most representative leaders in the field of cardiovascular imaging in our country. Today, it is a privilege. We have two pre the presence of two international, very well-known experts in the cardiovascular field to update this interesting topic, Professor William Sogby and Joao Cavalcante. We are also accompanied by a panel of local experts, Aldo Prado from Tucumán, an expert in echocardiography, Pablo Polono from La Plata, an expert in, in cardiac CT, and Juan Manuel Bonelli, an expert in MRI and CT. I just want to high, highlight the importance to turn off the camera and sound during the speaker conference uh, to have a better connectivity. We are, going to, we are going to have the two lectures in a row, and after that, we are going to have 20 minutes of Q&A. If anyone has any question, please send by chat. I hope anyone is going to enjoy this activity. And now I will hand over to Ricardo, who's going to present the first talk presentation. Ricardo. For me to present Professor William Sogby. Uh, Professor Sogby was born in Lebanon. Uh, it doesn't matter when, and don't ask about that. And he finished. <laughs> his medical career in the US, and since that time, he developed a successful academic and clinical performance, especially at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He did a, a great, a great job, and at the present time, he is professor of cardiology at Baylor College of Medicine, and also director of the Department of Cardiology at the Methodist Hospital in Houston. But his career is so big, I cannot talk all about KCB because we'll take the whole webinar. But let me tell that he has a, a lot of teaching and academic awards. Uh, as a master of American College of Cardiology, for instance, he has published more than 300 papers on the field. And he have uh, the great uh, possibility to do uh, many, many guidelines and many topics around the world. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Bill, long time ago, my mentor, Dr. Ernesto Salcedo, introduced me with Bill, and since that time, we shared a lot of scientific sessions in many places and many times. And But the, the most important thing that I remember in my work with Bill was the time when he was a president of American College of Cardiology, and he decided to create the Argentine chapter of American College, and we worked so hard to put together a federation and society. <laughs> He was a Bill initiative, and he did, and he's still working and developing. So thank you, Bill, for that opportunity, and thank you very much to join us this evening and give us your teaching expertise and also your time. Uh, he's you. going to talk about evolving new concepts in echocardiography in the field of uh, aortic stenosis. Bill, please. Ricardo and, and Carlos, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, I know we're far digitally now, but uh, I know I'm very close to the Argentinian um, cardiologists, uh, both the Federation and the society. And as Ricardo mentioned, uh, you know, I've been several times to Argentina. Hopefully we could do that next year face to face and be with you. Um, it's really a pleasure. I know Ricardo for many, many years, and it's been a pleasure knowing also more recently Carlos Dumont and uh, 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 Prado, uh, you know, all together, I think you guys are are amazing, really, in the field. And um, it's a pleasure also to share the podium, I guess, uh, uh, digitally with Joao. And hopefully, together, we can give you a feel of where aortic stenosis and some of the challenges, opportunities, maybe areas of research that you could, you know, think about. Uh, you know, going forward. So I will take on echocardiography and Joao will take uh, advanced imaging. So let me share, let me see if it works out here well. Let me share my screen with you. And in the next, here we go. Here you go. Can you see that? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Yes, wonderful. Okay, 
So uh, let's talk a little bit about aortic stenosis. I think nowadays aortic stenosis uh, should be well evaluated by most everyone, just to put us in the context of the disease itself. Usually three cusps, although it can be a bicuspid valve with congenital abnormalities. On the left lower is uh, rheumatic heart disease that you probably still see some. We don't see much of it in the United States. But to tell you that, if you're thinking about assessing with CT the amount of calcification in this valve and determining how bad the aortic stenosis is, I doubt you will be accurate. And therefore, the message to you from me is think hemodynamics as much as you can in addition to anatomy. This is calcific aortic stenosis where quite a few of the calcifications are in the cusp themselves. At times, they may spare actually the origin. So. You have to think about it as a disease that is degenerative disease that affects the annulus in addition to the cusps themselves and certainly the leaflets and their opposition in a way uh, that can cause both stenosis as well as regurgitation. I would like to refer you to about maybe three years ago now. These are the latest recommendations on the evaluation of aortic stenosis with a focused approach from the ASE and the European Society. I think that's important for you to know. What do we do with echocardiography? I think echocardiography is, is really a powerful technique. It is still the first line nowadays to evaluate valvular heart disease, including aortic stenosis. What do we do? We look at making sure that if we can assess the etiology of the aortic stenosis per se, assess the number of cusps, is this rheumatic, yes or no, the adaptation to the pressure overload, LV size as well as hypertrophy, ventricular function, systolic and diastolic, this one can give a lot of symptoms, right? And differentiate the etiology of a murmur between subaortic and supravalvular stenosis as well as HCM. So this is very important. This is a classic picture. I think most of you, if you're young, you may not know what this picture is about. If you have some gray hair, uh, you know that this is from Dr. Liv Hatley, who is quote unquote, the mother of Doppler echocardiography and and uh, specifies few things it exemplifies what happens with worsening aortic stenosis which are still qualitatively important one is that the velocity increases because of the narrowing increases two the ejection time increases three the shape and the peaking the maximal gradient that occurs occurs later in the systolic event now you know very well that this velocity and gradient, the pressure drop, right, are very dependent on flow. Orifice area, we'll talk about it, can be also dependent on flow, particularly if the flow is very low. So in low flow situations, this valve may not open well, even if it is normal. And therefore, also if it is stenotic, it may not open well. It may pose a challenge for us to be able to discern and see what to do about it. Uh, valve area is flow dependent, but much less so than certainly velocities themselves and gradients. And this is nostalgic for me because this was from our first paper on aortic stenosis back in the mid 80s, uh, validating aortic valve area in addition to what gradients are about. So when we take a look at aortic stenosis, we look at the maximal velocity and gradient, mean gradient, valve area using the continuity equation, and these are qualitative and to be semi-quantitative, the contour of the jet, the acceleration time, how long does it take, and the ejection time. Now, the criteria for severe aortic stenosis, and my advice to you is don't take one, one uh, measure alone, right? Particularly in intermediate cases, you have to take a look at velocity, valve area, and flow. For echocardiographer, they have to be very careful on the methodology because it involves, as you saw, the equation. It has measurements for each one of them, and each one of them can give errors, and therefore you may end up with a really bad error if you're not careful. And consideration for low flow situations where uh, it, the ejection fraction could be normal or depressed. Either way, low flow situations can affect uh, all these parameters that we are talking about. And these are the classic guidelines. They have not changed. But I think there are important things for you to remember. This velocity and gradient are usually in normal flow situations. 
Valid area, we use it most often when particularly we're dealing with intermediate lesions or low flow. We're really not sure about the severity of the aortic stenosis. One thing to remember from the guidelines is that this cutoff of one centimeter squared is sensitive and less specific compared to the others. Why? Because the best cutoff that goes along with a four meter jet as well as a 40 millimeters of mercury is about 0.8 centimeters squared. So the message to you is that if you want to be specific, if you're really not sure of how severe the aortic stenosis is closer to one or 0.9, and particularly in low flow situations, be careful. The tighter the valve is, the more confident you are that this is severe aortic stenosis. So remember from the guidelines that this cutoff, these are, uh, you know, a less than one centimeter square is more sensitive. The others are certainly very specific for severe aortic stenosis. And this is a case in point here. Valve area is 0.95, yet you know that this is not severe aortic stenosis. Mean gradient is 23, the peak velocity is about 3, the stroke volume is normal of 70, right? Nobody is rushing. Uh, to assign the symptoms of this patient to the disease, no rushing to do an intervention on this disease. So you follow these individuals, and this is that same patient being followed over time, actually a patient of mine. And you could see the valve area tightening over time, mean gradient increasing, and this is the time when he started to get symptomatic, still normal EF, normal stroke volume. It is very important for us, for you, if you are an echocardiographer, to know particularly this entity of low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. This definition, I would say is rather arbitrary. I mean, you could have a 40 ml per meter squared. You could have a 32 ml per meter squared. Don't hang on on just the, the cutoff values. Think about it globally, what the situation is, what ventricular function is, everything else, and make sure that you don't have much errors in these calculations. Think about the diameter. That's very important because we square that. In low stroke volume, you want to make sure that the ventricle makes sense. Ventricular function and ejection makes sense in addition to what the stroke volume is from the LV outflow tract. And as I told you also, this range is closer to moderate, actually. It depends on the situation, but it is not very tight. The tighter it is, is actually 0.8 and below. So keep those in mind. For the echocardiographer, make sure that these focal calcifications, calcifications that come down towards the mitral valve, are. this is not where you're going to measure the di diameter. If you see something like this, much more comfortable. If you measure this diameter, you know you will underestimate significantly LV outflow tract area, cross-sectional area. So use another site for flow or volumetric. Or just use gradient and say to the referring physician, I really cannot calculate the valve area for you. And if you need it, maybe you need to go for an MRI or a CT scan. So let's take a look at, at some examples here. This is a, a depressed ventricle, obviously, with a TVI of 16 and a stroke volume of 45, a peak velocity 2.7, a valve area of 0.7, yet the mean gradient is just 30. So this is where we'd like to increase flow to understand whether the severity is still tight. And this is nowadays, I think most individuals would do, is use a low dose dobutamine infusion with gradual infusion. You're not looking for ischemia here. You're looking to improve the cardiac output through this aortic valve and recalculate the gradient as well as the aortic area. And what we see is three responses usually. Increased stroke volume and NEF and the gradient increases, valve area doesn't change, and therefore severe aortic stenosis. If the flow increases, but the gradient stays about the same, therefore area will increase, AS is not severe. And at times you may not improve function at all. EF stays about the same, is flat, no contractile reserve, no gradient's about the same valve area, and then is this severe cardiomyopathy with no reserve, or is this severe AS causing the cardiomyopathy? We need more help here in this situation. And to me, this is truly where maybe CT would help in assessing how much calcifications, whether it doesn't tell you much about the hemodynamics of the situation. So let's take an example. An elderly individual with a lot of comorbidities, 
coronary disease, everything else, ejection fraction low, and has a murmur, obviously. And this is this is your aortic stenosis. The vital signs you could see them: a decent blood pressure and heart rate. And you know we need to do a dobutamine echocardiogram to see what the situation is in this severe aortic stenosis. And let's see what happens. Okay, uh, this is at baseline. A VTI of 16 with a stroke volume of 45 increases to 66. A nice VTI of 23. What happens to the valve itself? A peak velocity increases to 4. A mean gradient to 43. Valve area stays about the same almost. Yes, it will increase maybe a little bit, and that even with an error. Still, severe aortic stenosis, no question here. So this is low flow, low gradient severe AS. Contrast that patient with this one. This one shows a depressed ventricle again, uh, a wide QRS complex, you know, a valve that is calcific, right? Um, and then this is the dobutamian response, 5, 10 mics and peak. You can see that the ventricle has improved very desynchronous, actually, uh, from the 20s to the 30s, certainly did not normalize. However, stroke volume increased significantly. And you can see that here from a VTI of 12, to almost 20, a stroke volume that is now normal. And what happened? Peak velocity 2.7 stays almost the same at three. Mean gradient increases a bit. You know, it will increase because ejection time decreases a bit, but valve area has actually increased to 1.4. So this is, you know, the, this cardiomyopathy or depressed ejection fraction is not necessarily due to this bad aortic valve. Yes, the valve is bad, but it's not hemodynamically tight to cause it. So it is mild aortic stenosis and may, may worsen over time. So to kind of summarize the situation here, if you have a low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with a depressed ventricular function and the mean gradient is low, valve area is uh, tight, you do a low dose dobutamine stress echo. If the gradient increases significantly, you have true severe aortic stenosis. If the gradient stays on the lower side. The valve area is still greater than one. It is pseudo severe, just like I showed you in this last case. And in between, you have to kind of refine and understand what the situation is. If the mean gradient is still on the lower side and the valve area is still tight, take a look at how much of that changed. Well, how much is the stroke volume change actually, right? Uh, is it close to a severe aortic stenosis cutoff? What is the other qualitative indices of aortic stenosis, right? And also, if you're really still in doubt, you may want to use a calcium score uh, in women greater than 1,200. And I think Joao will talk about that. Uh, you know, I mean, in the guideline, or at least in some of the publications, people just go almost straight to this. I am of the, I wouldn't call it old school, I'm a little old, but not that old, uh, is hemodynamics are really the most important thing to understand it because as you know, the calcifications in aortic stenosis, and we're talking here, the degenerative aortic stenosis, that's what we see most of the time, is akin to me, to calcium score of a coronary disease. You can have a lot of calcifications, but the stenosis may not be tight. Why? Because these calcifications are not at the tips of these cusps. They are in the annulus in addition to the cusp itself, inner cusp. So be careful about it. And there is a lot of variability in it and a lot of spread of the data. So be careful on how you're going to use it. I would use hemodynamics number one and calcium score in, in cases where really things don't improve at all. No change in stroke volume. I cannot do anything about hemodynamics. So let's talk about paradoxical low flow. Don't complicate things for your life. Basically, it's a normal EF in a small ventricle and uh, multiple etiologies, right? So you have a normal EF and low stroke volume. Why? Because maybe you have pronounced concentric remodeling. Uh, you may have a small ventricle, somebody with hypertension, a very tiny ventricle, and a small uh, older individual, mitral regurgitation. All these etiologies can cause reduced stroke volume and a reduced transvalvular flow. This is an example. Hypertrophy, you could see. You could even wonder within you know, your mind whether there is uh, amyloid disease on top of this uh, individual, right? Irrespective, if you look at what these numbers are, the total volume is just 55, mean gradient 23, and a valve area of 
My advice in these situations, and this is where I see a lot of problems, is you want to make sure that these numbers, and at times it could be even lower than 55, that these numbers make sense. If you take a look at the ventricle estimated and diastolic volume with an ejection fraction, this stroke volume has to be somewhere close, within 10% or so. Mm -hmm. So if I do, and I check it, I double check it, the end diastolic volume is 95 and systolic volume 45. So yes, small ventricle and a, a total stroke volume of 50. Yes, 50, 50, I have certainly with an error, even 10 millimeter, milliliter differences with an error. But at least it will give you that confidence. And I've written an editorial, and I think you need to take a look at that, mostly because it tells you all the nuances that you need to do. And I subtitled it, Trust But Verify. Yes, there is an entity of paradoxical low flow aortic stenosis, but we want to make sure that the flow is indeed low as opposed to falsely low. So you have to verify it with either another site, pulmonic flow, some other you know, output measure, LV, ejection fraction, multiplied by endostatic volume, whatever it is. Last is I'm going to share with you some newer data on prognosis. This is all data. This is low flow severe aortic stenosis, low ejection fraction. This is all black 2003 or so. Important because there are some newer data that contradict this. Group one, there is a contractile reserve during the vitamin. Group two, not much of a contractile reserve. Bottom line here, if you don't have much contractile reserve, mortality is much higher than if you had basically more viability in this heart. These are the groups. Group one had some viability. Group two did not have viability. If you reverse, if you change the valve, if you do aortic valve replacement, both groups improve. The worst group is medical therapy without contractile reserve, right here. Okay. And uh, what what are the predictors of poor outcome? If AFib is present on top of that, multivessel coronary disease a low mean gradient, meaning, I mean, just like the flow is very low and maybe the valve area is a little bigger, a Euro score that is high. So certainly this is a surgical intervention on these patients. Now in the, in the era of TAVR, we have some more recent data. The largest data probably is from the partner trial. And I think these are important data. You may not see the fine print, but I'll guide you. This is from partner A and B. You know, the, remember the B is where, uh, Basically, it was inoperable or just very high risk for operation. These are death, two year death. Okay. The worst death is low flow situation. Okay. Normal flow is better, be it TAVR or surgery. TAVR or surgery, low, uh, normal flow is better. Low flow, either one is, is bad. Uh, here is medical therapy versus TAVR and that uh, partner B. The worst situation, again, is medical therapy without intervention, and, and, and TAVR certainly followed. This is an interesting one to me that needs further validation. Is Again, this is in partner A and B, uh, uh, classified according to flow by echocardiography and ejection fraction. If you have low flow through the aortic valve versus normal flow, the low flow had a worst outcome at two years. This is two years death. Okay. However, if you look at the low flow situation, it didn't matter whether ejection fraction was normal or reduced, meaning that the flow situation was predominantly determining outcome. And you could say why? Well, conceivably why? It goes to the etiology of the low flow. Either a bad EF, or even if the EF is not bad, if you have low flow, you probably have a lot of concentric hypertrophy, maybe other uh, comorbidities in these elderly populations, so many other things. So it is very interesting actually to think about that. This is more recent data looking at TAVR patients in low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. And this is throwing a wrench in English, they say throwing a wrench, meaning putting doubt on the importance of dobutamine stress echo from a prognostic point of view. 
234 patients or so underwent dobutamine. Some patients, 45%, almost half of them had contractile reserve. The others did not. And I want you to take a look at this one here. This is free from cumulative death or so, okay? And this is with contractile reserve versus without. The prognosis was the same. Very unusual, and that's why I showed you the older data with SAVR. I don't know if the population is very different. Maybe a lot of comorbidities and other things. Remember, you know, these, these patients had a valve, you know, put in, right? Now, the interesting thing, another one which is unusual, is that the change in ejection fraction after TAVR, although it improved, was not predicted by dobutamine echocardiography. So with or without contractile reserve, ejection fraction improved. I would like more information on this because it, show, it, it goes against of what we all think as to what happens. And last, I'm going to tell you that with the advent of TAVR, now we can take a look at moderate aortic stenosis in patients who have a very poor ventricular function. And conceivably is if you relieve even some gradient, and it may not be very severe, do you improve outcome? And the reason for it is that the outcome in these patients is very poor. And there are trials, and low trial is one of them that is going to look at this. So in conclusion, few things regarding aortic stenosis from an echocardiography assessment. One, echodoppler is the first line modality, be it you're in Argentina or in the United States or wherever you are in the world. Attention to details and sources of error is crucial for accuracy. So you have to be a good echocardiographer to be able to do that and, and be careful. In those situations where you're not comfortable, just say it. Because if you have MRI or if you have CT or even good old hemodynamics and the cath lab, I think that would work better than giving bad data. Aortic stenosis is a continuum. You know, you take a look at tables and everything else. Patients don't come in tables. So it is a continuum. These cutoffs are rather arbitrary. So look at the flow, gradient, jet dynamics, uh, and integrate it with everything else that's going on in this ventricle. And low flow AS may be seen in, in depressed or normal ventricle. I, I Personally, I don't differentiate between them because I want to make sure that my calculations are correct. In depressed EF, AVA needs to be repeated, hopefully with a higher flow, let's say with the butamine stress echo, just to give you the diagnostic accuracy of severity. In normal EF, it has multiple etiologies, leading to a small ventricle with preserved EF. Low stroke volume by Doppler needs to be corroborated. You want to make sure that this number is really close to the truth. And last is aortic stenosis in the presence of low flow imparts a worse prognosis, no matter what, irrespective of valve replacement. It is likely related to all the factors that are leading to the low flow condition, be it normal EF or a depressed EF. Conflicting data regarding the prognostic impact of contractile reserve with DSE is present now, and I think we need to have a little better feel for that. And there are some interventions ongoing with TAVR in moderate AS when patients have a depressed ventricular function. And we will await to see whether you know, it will have an impact, maybe improve symptoms or improve prognosis in these individuals with depressed AS. So that's what I have for you. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to share that with you and uh, look forward to Joao's presentation and the discussion later. Let me unshare. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Very nice presentation. Now I, I will introduce Joao. Joao is director of the Career MRI and Structural CT Lab in Minneapolis, our Institute Foundation Imaging Research Center. He also is the chair of the work, uh, valvular working group at the Society of Cardiac Magnetic Resonance. He has had an important scientific production in this field in the last years. And we all know that although echocardiography is the primary diagnostic tool, a phenotype in use in multimodality imaging is an important, important role in, in improving patient selection and, and timing for intervention. So this is important. Uh, Joao is going to give us some insight about this. Joao, thank you very much for, 
for being part of this activity. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Carlos, Ricardo, it's uh, really hard to follow you know, the footsteps of Dr. Zogby here, who uh, I'm so honored to be sharing this podium, virtual podium together with him. Um, and I am humbled by the, uh, again, opportunity to present to you today. Uh, if I may just uh, find a way that I can PowerPoint. Um, all right, can you see my screen? Yes. And I'm going to make this full screen, so hopefully you can see it well. Yes? That's okay. Perfect. Okay. So, muchísimas gracias uh, por la, por la oportunidad. Y acá estoy muy feliz y honrado para compartir and share with you today some thoughts about theoretic stenosis. And for this particular talk, you know, just some relevant disclosures that our imaging core lab in Minneapolis here has some research contracts for which I do not take any personal um, financial benefit from that. It goes to the institution, Minneapolis Science Institute Foundation. There is no doubt that TAVR uh, has been a game changer on the way how we treat patients with theoretic stenosis. And for this to become really the mainstay therapy for treatment of this disease, uh, it had to go through several iterations and several improvements. Uh, from a two-dimensional measurement to now uh, the understanding that the annulus is a three-dimensional structure that moves, that pulsates throughout the cardiac cycle. And then the measurements need to be not only accurate, but more importantly, reproducible. And the standardization of this uh, took some time for the image acquisition, but also for the post-processing and analysis to make this a very effective therapy for treating these patients. We do several measurements by CT of the aortic annulus, of the LVOT, of the aortic root, the dimensions of the root, the calcification, as I will talk about, the dimensions and the distance of the coronary arteries. And obviously, we look at the, at the transfemoral axis, which should be the preferred uh, methodology and axis for these patients, but sometimes not always feasible. We need to go into the carotid subclavian or even transaortic, although the transapical has really favored out over these last few years. A couple words on the aortic valve calcium score, just uh, adding to what Dr. Zagibi had mentioned. As you know, this is a flow independent metric of aortic stenosis severity. It should be considered, particularly in these patients in which we have a discrepant assessment. Your patients have a low aortic valve area and low gradients, and it can provide a useful discrimination of the severity. The acquisition is performed in our center for every single TAVR patient, uh, TAVR acquisition, uh, because it corroborates the echocardiographic data, particularly in these uh, low flow, low graded patients. It's similar to a calcium score, so it's prospective, it has to be ECG gated, does not require contrast acquisition between two and a half to three millimeters. And then we do the scoring. Be careful to not include, obviously, the uh, aortic, uh, the LVOT or the mitral annulus or the aortic root calcifications. There are different thresholds for women and men. This is the first work by Anik, uh, Marie Annick Clavel, uh, showing that women, for the same degree of aortic stenosis, have less calcification than men. Women around 1,300, 1,274, for men around 2,000. And importantly, these cutoffs were confirmed and validated in this large multicentric study that we were part of when I was back in Pittsburgh 918 patients, eight international centers, different scanners, different post-processing software, but we came up with a very similar cut points for severity of aortic stenosis. 1,300 for women, 2,000 for men. Obviously, this is a spectrum. And just to say that the woman is 1,305, it's not severe. It's obviously a spectrum, and you need to integrate as you did, you have done with the echocardiographic variables. Moving from the valve into other things that we need to do better. CT also has informed some particular um, um, risks that these patients could have for the development of left bundle branch block and even complete heart block. I mean, this to this date, 2020, still for some centers, majority of the time, a double digit problem. And what I mean by that is that pacemaker is still in the 12, 14% of patients. It's so obviously it's higher if patients already present with a right bundle branch block. Uh, 
it's higher perhaps if the patient does not have a very long membranous septum because you don't have a lot of leeway, you don't have a lot of space, and you have to land at pretty much zero. And this is the work by Hamdan from Israel showing that the shorter the membranous septum, shorter the membranous septum, the higher the potential for AV block. And obviously for patients that would be receiving self-expanding because of the lack of the control, and sometimes these valves diving into the LVOT uh, that could produce. This is just an example, not with the self-expanding, but even with a balloon expandable that landed probably about two millimeters deep, but the membranous septum was very short, and this patient ended up with a pacemaker. This is getting better as we are being able to control better the deployment angle even for self-expanding platforms like the Evolute by Medtronic, there are also refinements on the deployment technique to provide better angles and to minimize this pacemaker risk. But that's something that we provide at the CT analysis for the implanters. Again, a couple words on the calcium, not only from the valve, but also in the LVOT, the calcification of what we call the device landing zone which is a four millimeters below the aortic annulus. And that's important because it could be associated not only with this um, pacemaker, the um, de development of the pacemaker, because you're pressing into the membranous septum with the calcification, but also gaps that could lead into the development of paravalvular leaks, despite the ceiling skirt that these valves would have, as well as if you go too aggressive and too much oversizing, even for the injury of the aortic root and annular rupture, which still occurs to this date, but much less so because of better oversizing and sizing mechanisms. Developments also in 2CT have allowed us to take the entire data set of the patient and develop an individualized prediction of not only paravalvular leak, which has improved, but also for potential conduction normalities. And this is work by FIOPS, which is a company in Belgium, by taking into the CT and simulating a prosthesis and trying to understand according to the many variables that would be you know, able to be computed by the computer tomography, predicting who'd be potentially at risk for pacemaker need. Now, moving from the valve into the ventricle myocardium, uh, one exciting work that we have had the chance to uh, develop uh, in partnership with TomTech at that time was the capability of doing CT strain analysis. So because the acquisition is multiphasic, meaning that's entire cardiac cycle, and you have good opacification of the left ventricle and sometimes even the right ventricle, we can compute similar to echocardiography global longitudinal strain, which as you know, is a more sensitive marker of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. This is not in a TAVA population. You can see this patient does not have aortic stenosis, but has ischemic mitral regurgitation, the mitral valve does not coapt. The patient has ischemic cardiomyopathy, and this is something that our group has been uh, pioneering. Uh, this unfortunately does not play, but this was the first paper uh, using this prototype TomTech software validating the same software for echo and for CT, showing that the numbers are not interchangeable, but there is a decent correlation between these two modalities uh, using a first generation 64 slide CT scanner. Now, obviously, we took a step further and then we included 223 patients. This is back in Pittsburgh. Majority of these patients had an SDS of around 6.5 to 7%, so intermediate to high risk. And as you could see, uh, that looking at LV ejection fraction is old news. All patients received TAVR, but in patients that had normal ejection fraction, by normal here, we look at different thresholds. We look at 50%, 55%, 60%. Actually, the higher we went with the ejection fraction, uh, the bigger the separation was. So normal ejection fraction does not discriminate. However, reduced GLS, and by this was a reduced GLS of minus 20 by CT. Again, the numbers are not similar to echocardiography, perhaps a little bit higher by CT. But if you have normal EF and reduced GLS, your outcomes are as equal as those that had impaired ejection fraction. And this was uh, seen not only for all-cause mortality, but also for the composite outcome of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations 
despite having TAPR, despite having transcapillary aortic valve replacement. What we are taking into now is using a higher, um, the better CT scanner. Uh, this is using dual source, uh, which has a much better temporal resolution and, and image quality. And we're doing this assessment pre and post TAPR. And as you can see, uh, we can do these measurements very nicely and with a very high feasibility for these patients. So could CT be then the holistic approach? Uh, yes, the echo is still helpful, uh, but CT can look into the aortic valve calcification, the valve, the jet velocity. Obviously, this is by echo, but we can look at the calcification. We can look at the remodeling of that left ventricle. We can calculate GLS and perhaps even myocardial fibrosis as we're talking to the end. What about cardiac MRI? Well, in MRI, um, things can be somewhat similar to the CT as far as the measurement of the annulus. So this is reserved to a very small cohort of patients that have advanced chronic kidney disease um, that could not receive um, iodine contrast. Uh, nowadays, with better CT scanners, we can do a very low contrast enhancement. This is work that we started back in Pittsburgh, attempting to do CT, I'm sorry, to do CMR um, with a free breathing acquisition and having measurements that were very similar to CT. Um, we can use the same software to look at the coplanar angle. And if you have the MRI and you have a non-contrast CT, you can do what we call co-register, which is fuse these two data sets. And then we can get the information about the calcification, as well as the information about the anatomy by MRI. Again, this is a small subgroup of patients that's probably not what the MRI can do its best which I believe is actually doing a deep dive into the myocardial disease that these patients will have. Obviously, we know the MRI is the gold standard for the evaluation of ventricular function and remodeling. We can even do look at the aortic valve morphology and can correlate the planimetry, can measure velocities and flow. Um, we can look at coronary artery disease and look at the perfusion coronary artery disease that this patient might have. Assessment of the aortic annulus, as we talked about, 4D4 MRI is promising that we might be able to uh, look at that flow quantification um, with improvements on its acquisition and post-processing too. Uh, but the tissue characterization is something that MRI can really provide um, secondary to um, no other modality. But the look at the replacement fibrosis as a scar with late gadolinium enhancement imaging, this diffuse interstitial fibrosis, which is what we measure by what we call ECV or extracellular volume, the expansion of the interstitium, be that by fibrosis or by other proteins, and obviously the detection of cardiac amyloidosis, which is not uncommon in these patients. And the expert consensus in 2017 uh, recommended that cardiac MRI could be important, particularly in these patients with low flow, low gradient, with depressed DF for the evaluation of scar fibrosis and also for the evaluation of ischemia and scar. This is one of the most important papers that has come out uh, the last couple of years. There's a large registry by several centers in UK and Scotland. Um, at the time that you, you know, UK was still part of the European Union, now they're a separate uh, entity, but almost 700 patients um, that all received either SAVR or TAVR, and they had a pit stop into the cardiac MRI. SCAR was present in 51% of these patients. That's not trivial, that's 51%. That's half of these patients. And the most common phase of form of SCAR was the non-infarcted SCAR. When present, SCAR doubled the yield cause mortality, as you can see, and tripled the cardiovascular mortality. And that was regardless whether patients received surgical or transcatheter AVR. This is an example of a patient with a subendocardial SCAR infarct involving the circumflex or WEM distribution. And this is an example of non-ischemic patch midwall fibrosis, typically associated with the increase of LV mass or hypertrophy, as you can see. And it was not only whether you have or not have scar, but also the amount of scar that can be quantified by cardiovascular uh, magnetic resonance imaging, it uh, increased their cause mortality and the cardiovascular mortality. And we were fortunate to be asked to ask uh, to uh, write this editorial along with my colleague, Paul Suraja, uh, to call the question that, um, are we providing too little or too late of a benefit? And I don't think that's what it is, but certainly we should try to aim our target much more upstream. 
it made a lot of sense for us to withhold therapies when this surgical intervention had a lot of morbidity and you know, collateral damage to the patient. But nowadays that we have a very effective therapy vis-a-vis -vis TAVR, does it make sense for weight to symptoms? And that's what Mark Dweck uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland, is trying to do along with many other centers, looking at patients that are asymptomatic with bona fide severe aortic stenosis. They'll be screened for decompensation with high sensitivity troponin and EKG strain to have a higher yield of these patients that could have potentially have fibrosis. They will receive cardiac MRI. If the MRI shows no fibrosis, they will be followed just for the current uh, standard of care. Um, or if they have fibrosis, then they get randomized to um, the standard of care, which will be watchful waiting. Just wait for the symptoms to come or randomize at the presence of the midwall fibrosis for either surgery or TAVR. Um, and they have enrolled more than 150 patients uh, last time that I had talked to him. And uh, this is obviously has slowed down with the COVID, uh, but might be an important study to provide us, you know, the, in the identification of the fibrosis. Obviously, there is a more pragmatic study that is ongoing here in the United States that it's called early TAVR that does not involve cardiac MRI. That is, if you're asymptomatic and you demonstrate that by that on the treadmill, it's not a treadmill to evoke ischemia. When for, or anything like that, but a very low-grade treadmill. And if you have no symptoms, you should proceed with TAVR or watch for waiting. So this does not involve cardiac MRI, but both of the studies would be complementary to provide us an insight into should we intervene even before the development of symptoms. And the reason that we think that this could be important is that once fibrosis seen by LGE is present, and you don't do anything and you're waiting for symptoms, this fibrosis will continue to increase. This is what we call the replacement fibrosis here in yellow. AVR, aortic valve replacement, will stop that fibrosis, but would not be removed. What AVR would do is hopefully produce some reverse remodeling of the hypertrophy if this patient does not have prosthesis patient mismatch and you control the blood pressure. Because if you don't do that, then obviously, you know, the hypertrophy will still remain there. But if you do it properly, it should remove some of that afterload mismatch. And by doing that, also improve some of that diffuse fibrosis. But the scar is not going to go away. And we should try to intervene before a scar because, as we have heard, scar is not a good player. And the concept that we're trying to introduce here is something that has been described many, many years ago by Han Hoffman looking at myocardial biopsies. You know, he looked at myocardial biopsies of patients that had received surgical AVR, and what he saw was this interstitial expansion here between the myocytes. And this interstitial expansion, he called in a low power, it looked like cirrhosis of the heart. You know, we talk about interstitial lung disease or interstitial heart, you know, liver disease, but we don't talk about interstitial heart disease. And that's actually what severe AS might cause, and sometimes with other players as well. This validation of the extracellular volume fraction has been done against biopsy by different groups, uh, showing a decent correlation. And I think that's the power that cardiac MRI could have. Our group back in Pittsburgh had shown that in patients with theoretic stenosis, contrasting with normal individuals, they have a elevation of the extracellular volume, 28 plus or minus four, whereas the normal should be around 24 plus or minus two. As you can see, despite receiving AVR, the higher the ECV, the worse the outcome. As you can see that patients with normal ECV had no events at 12 months. Could this be a way that we could also say, well, if you have a normal CV, you could potentially stay in this watchful waiting strategy because your interstitial is not expanded and you don't have symptoms, perhaps. Uh, but that could be a, you know, a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Uh, Mark Dweck um, and us and many other groups uh, together published this uh, last year, uh, actually early this year, uh, looking at uh, ECV in a larger cohort of patients, of 440 patients, showing that there was an association of a progressive increase in all-cause mortality according to third tiles of extracellular volume.
in patients that receive aortic valve replacement. That's to say that the higher the ECV, the worse the outcomes, and that's even after accounting for scar for the fibrosis. So we don't want that to happen, and perhaps we should try to move and continue to move upstream. What else could be also causing this extracellular volume expansion? And this is a case of an 88-year-old male that presented with a worsening dyspnea and exertion fatigue. He had the typical risk factors of patients seen uh, for the TAVR uh, clinic with AFib, diabetes, HFPF, chronic kidney disease, COPD. He had low gradient aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction, possibly severe AS, a mean gradient of 25 millimeters of mercury, in a valve area of one. He captured non obstructive CAD and he was transferred for TAVR evaluation. And his aortic valve calcium score was 1850, so it's slightly lower than the 2000, just to give you a little bit of the flavor. This is his echocardiogram. As you can see, there is increased uh, wall thickness of both the left and I would argue perhaps even the right ventricle. Preserved ejection fraction, calcification of the mitral level, as well as the aortic valve. The stroke volume index, he was in AFib, so an averaging of multiple cardiac cycles showed a stroke volume index of 30 ml per meter square with a flow that was slightly reduced, a mean flow of 200 milliliters per second, and also a low valve area with mean gradients ranging anywhere between 35 to 28, a valve area that was low. So low flow, low gradient, low valve area with preserved ejection fraction. His uh, strain maps um, were feasible, but we cannot get the bullseye, as you know, because of the RR interval variability. But needless to say that it was a relative apical sparing of the most uh, apical segments here, minus 32, minus 33. And as you come closer to the base, they are reduced, which had been previously reported in a non-AS population associated with cardiac amyloidosis. So with that, we took the patient to the cardiac MRI. As you can see, this patient remains in atrial fibrillation. Uh, here on the right atrium, there is a small pericardial fusion circumferential. The aortic valve is tight and calcified. The ejection fraction is preserved. But I think, you know, after the gadolinium is injected, one can see that this myocardium, which is from a patient, another patient with severe aortic stenosis, nice and dark, without scar, this is his uh, ventricle. It's completely infiltrated, uh, both not only the left ventricle, but also the right ventricle and the atria as well. So this, uh, until proven otherwise, is cardiac amyloidosis, which was confirmed ultimately by actually technician pyrophosphate scan. And this is not uncommon, um, was thought to be rare, but the advances in technology now are allowing us to detect this much more commonly um, in an unselected HEPPOC population, about 13%. And this work by Castaño from Colombia showing that about a, you know 16% of these patients who received TAVR had um, wild type ATTR confirmed by technician pyrophosphate with this low flow, low gradient, more common, more common in males. And, this was one of the first papers to say, hey, pay attention to that. That's one in six patients. It didn't tell us about the outcomes. Um, cardiac MRI is helpful also to detect what we call the phenocopies, which means that it looks like HCM, but it's not HCM. So is this truly HCM? So this is a patient that has an infarct in a certain flex, and by doing that, then he has an asymmetric hypertrophy, quote unquote. Uh, but this is actually cardiac amyloidosis with infiltration of the atrium and infiltration of the right ventricle as well, as I shown before. And this is another patient uh, that I had the chance to take care of, um, you know, on the weekend. He had received TAVR about six months before for not low flow low gradient, but severe aortic stenosis, peak velocity 4.7, high mean gradient. But despite having a successful TAVR without paravalvular leak, he kept having heart failure. And not everything is wild type tri transthyretin. Um, this case, actually, he ended up having a primary cardiac amyloidosis with multiple myeloma and high plasma cells. So not because everybody is old that is going to be senile, and the treatment is important because it's going to be completely different for these patients. This is a recent review on this particular topic. Uh, if you are interested by uh, Ternaco and colleagues, showing that to this date, we do not have any data to suggest that we should withhold treatment of these patients. When you see aortic stenosis plus cardiac amyloidosis, uh, 
we should consider still tethering. Obviously, there's a discussion that we need to have with the family. Uh, the symptomatic benefit might be lessened. And perhaps we should try to choose a valve that will create less paravalvular leak and less pacemaker because they don't tolerate given the stiffness of this ventricle paravalvular leak. These are two uh, series from UK, from London, um, small series, but showing that TAVR, when performed, did a better uh, advantage to these patients. And this is a more recent uh, study of 200 patients, uh, age of 75. They found a prevalence of 13%. And as you can see here, when TAVR was provided to these patients, there was no significant difference whether they have lone aortic stenosis or aortic stenosis with cardiac amyloidosis. However, if they are medically treated, quote unquote, they don't do it so well. Um, and this perhaps opens up the discussion of, should we treat the valve and then the myocardium? Um, this is a recent publication that we had a couple of weeks ago now, combining the data from Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, and also Columbia, uh, showing uh, that there was no difference in mortality when these patients got treated with TAVR. Uh, but there was a signal actually for one year heart failure readmission. So they might not derive um, actually benefit from the heart failure standpoint, obviously because the ventricle is sick. And as you can see, uh, partner 1A and 1B, this was the high risk inoperable cohort. These patients fall right underneath them, uh, but not as good as partner 2A. To suggest that the myopathy related to the cardiac amyloidosis. It's something to pay attention to, but which they might still derive benefit from TAVR. How can we move the needle? I mean, can we perhaps use CT? And now going back and closing my lecture to CT, can CT then identify cardiac amyloidosis? And the answer is perhaps yes. Um, we have some good signal uh, by working with the group from BARTS uh, that has pioneered this measurement by CT. We need to do a pre-contrast which is what we use typically for the calcium score. And then we need to do a delayed acquisition. Um, ECV by CT in patients with aortic stenosis is very similar to MRI, about 28%. And in patients that have cardiac amyloidosis, that's not the overlap. That's just pure cardiac amyloidosis. They have a much higher ECV as you would expect. And this is a publication that is ahead of print and Jack imaging that we were part of combining our cohort with BARTS, looking at uh, cardiac amyloidosis and aortic stenosis, as you can see, is a spectrum. Um, the higher the ECV, the higher will be the uptake on the technician pyrophosphate. And we suggest that perhaps even during the TAVA workup, one could calculate the ECV with just this additional delayed scan about three minutes. And if the ECV is about 31%, you need to confirm whether or not they might have cardiac amyloidosis with bone scintigraphy and many of this work. So perhaps CT could not only provide us the information about the TAVR, but perhaps the screening for this entity, which might deserve some further attention and even treatment. So in conclusion, the context of aortic stenosis, multimodality imaging by both CT and MRI can provide us a great insight about not only the valve, the vessels, and the myocardium, the CT has transformed our assessment and planning. Watching for ejection fraction is not enough, and GLS or global longitudinal strain is upstream and can measure you know, by both modalities. So who needs an echo? I would say this is obviously a rhetorical question because echo is primordial and we still need it uh, to inform us where to go and assess other valve problems. The fibrosis is an important marker, and we should try to intervene hopefully before its development. And cardiac amyloidosis is common and begs the question, should we consider pre tavr screening? And if you're interested in this overlap, I would uh, welcome you to uh, send me an email. We are planning now to uh, recruit many other centers. So far, we have pledged about 150 patients from multicentric institutions. Every institution has a little bit of this case, so every little bit counts. And with that, we will be able to provide us many insights into the treatment of this dual pathology. And, We'd like to acknowledge also our lab uh, here in Minneapolis Heart Institute, the Cardiac MRI and the CT lab, and many other collaborators too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joao. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we are going to put the local experts in the field. Who, who's going to start? I want to start because I'm there. 
I'm the older panelist. Aldo, 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 Aldo. I like that Aldo okay. is uh, kicking off. Go ahead, Aldo. Oh, I, I have a, a many questions. Actually, actually, they're really, really nice presentation. Thank you to to Bill and Bob. And I, I would try to to make a, a practical approach. What do you do if you have patients with normal EF, severe aortic stenosis, and you have, for example, abnormal GLF? Uh, is it still uh, power this information to decide to intervene this this patient in the uh, and you know even if they are asymptomatic or what do you do in these cases or are you using MRI or CT in all of these in order to decide what to do? Um. I'll, I'll take this one, and I want to hear Joe's. We would not interfere. We would not do something on it, only abnormal GLS. And the reason for it is you would expect that GLS be abnormal in severe aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. If it is truly severe, there is remodeling of the ventricle with a lot of hypertrophy. And whenever you have a lot of hypertrophy, and this is pathologic hypertrophy, GLS, which is the longitudinal strain, right? Longitudinal strain, not circumferential and not radial, will be abnormal in almost any hypertrophy, abnormal hypertrophy, okay? And we don't have any data to tell us that indeed, if I operate on a, on a abnormal GLS, that my outcome would be better. And I want outcome to be long-term outcome as opposed to immediate or within a year or two. Now, there are different situations though. If you combine an abnormal GLS with symptoms, even diastolic function symptoms, we know most likely they will relate to abnormal deposits by fibrosis, similar to what Joao has showed you. Uh, you know, testing somebody for symptoms. And there are some recent data telling us that we may not to need to be as conservative in waiting for definite, definite symptoms. As you know very well, you can have super severe aortic stenosis with a gradient 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury, right? And, uh, and I think overall they'll do better with an earlier intervention. So in the yes. younger, it's a different ball game, and the older, I think, buying one year is not as aggressive necessarily. I completely agree with Bill. Uh, at this point in time, we don't have outcomes that are to suggest that we should intervene based on uh, GLS. And actually, GLS is also after load dependent. Um, not only the you know mismatch created by the aortic stenosis, we, you know, if you do a GLS immediately 48 hours or 24 hours after topper, you would see that the GLS will improve. So, you know, and that's why GLS is not a surrogate of fibrosis, which a lot of people can think of. Yes, in the presence of an infarct, you know, if there is replacement fibrosis by an infarct and everything, that GLS, that contractility is going to be down. That's, that's different. But in the presence of preserved ejection fraction, GLS does not equal fibrosis. Uh, they're actually complementary and additive. It's a very sensitive index of abnormality. And the question, your question is very clinically oriented, meaning should I intervene? And unfortunately, our interventions are not the greatest, right? Mm -hmm. Pablo, do you have any question? Yes. Hello, very nice presentations. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we, Joao, we, we have to, to leave something for the echo, echocardiographist for, because <laughs> we do you want to, to do everything with the CT scan? Um, no, it's, that's not the... <laughs> it's amazing. It's a new field, the, the GLS, the, you, you can do everything you want. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, but the question is, in, in patients with uh, low, low flow, low gradient, and 
suspect of amyloidosis. Um, you show that approximately 13, 15, 16 percent of patients with aortic stenosis and in TAVR has uh, amyloidosis. Which is the follow-up of this patient in your point of view? So as far as the follow-up, as far as, you know, what should be done with these patients beyond TAVR? Mm -hmm. what, what are we supposed to have to do with this patient? No, I think as I, I mentioned, Pablo, and, and I, you know, your, your question is obviously uh, an interesting one. You know, YSTT is doing so much, and I think the information is all there. We, you know, when we do the TAVR acquisition, the whole cardiac cycle is there. So, but we are just focusing on the annulus. We just take one measurement. Obviously, automation will help. For the aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis, as I mentioned, there is no data to suggest that we should withhold treatment. Obviously, we need to know who is in the driving seat. There is amyloidosis and amyloidosis, right? I mean, there are patients that, you know, are dying with, you know, aortic stenosis, and there are other patients that are dying from aortic stenosis. So mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we understand who is the main player. But it also brings the possibility that in the presence of cardiac amyloidosis that is identified hopefully before the TAVR to allow treatment. Uh, Tefamidis, for example, which is a Pfizer drug that has been FDA approved and has had a lot of pushback because of the high copay that these patients have, um, took at least 18 months to separate the curves. It provided a benefit, but you need to have these patients exposed for a long period of time. Could that mm. be that if you identify cardiac amyloidosis in the presence of moderate aortic stenosis, could you start treatment around that time? You know, and then by the time the valve becomes severe, then you intervene. I mean, that's why we are proposing this registry to try to understand these nuances in treatment, which we still don't have. But so far, please treat the tower, and that's actually much cheaper than treating them with the families. <laughs> All of a sudden, tower became a very cheap proposition. What do you think, Bill? Thank you. I agree. I think, you know, well, we don't have yet the strong data regarding amyloidosis and which ones would uh, would benefit from the dual approach of having a TAVR, which is expensive, remember that, and uh, and it depends what their age is and so many other things, particularly within the vast majority is the older population, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to, each one of us have to kind of put those in, into context, and that's why it's, um, it is a, a complex multi factorial things that you have to do. But uh, it's good to know the data, and I'm glad you're doing the registry, Joao, because, uh, you know, it's important to to see how you address it. Juan Manuel, do you like to ask a question now? Okay. Thank both for the presentation. Very nice. So for Joao, you show us after aortic replacement, we observe mass regression, Remodeling regression, decreased diffuse fibrosis, and extracellular volume. So, how long do you wait to perform new MRI in this patient? And if you use or select MRI, MRI to follow up this patient? That's a great question here, Juan. Uh, so far to this date, there is no data to suggest the guidance of when we should repeat the cardiac MRI. It's obviously, as you know, echocardiographic follow up. At our institution, we have started a registry that we do this MRI through research at one year um, because, you know, the remodeling might be seen immediately after, but the regression of the fibrosis from some other um, conversations with other collaborators, it takes a longer time. Um, and we are looking into this, um, obviously, you know, to see if we see a signal. But definitely uh, what we have seen is that some of these patients, after you have fixed the valve, you unmask hypertension as well, and that is something that is quite important to be addressed uh, before and after, because now you're going to have a much better way to control that. But let's address hypertension, because arterial stiffness, which I did not have the chance to talk about, is also another important player. These arteries are not as distensible as in a younger population, and they uh, have difficulties, and that can have a crosstalk with the ventricle too. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Carlos? Ricardo, Ricardo, go ahead. Uh, one of the, there is uh, any, any of the panelists to ask another question? I think that we have more yeah. time. May I? Aldo, Pablo, yeah, Aldo? I, I, I want to ask, I want to ask to, 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 to Bill, uh, how often do you need a CT or MRI to decide what to do in this aortic stenosis patient? Because I have the idea that using clinics and echo, you can decide when. So probably MRI or CT could be necessary in order to decide uh, what to do or if a tower is indicated or not in some patients. But how often in your clinical practice do you need an MRI or CT to decide what to do in this patient? I think that's a very uh, that's a very important and practical question at the same time. Um, I can tell you the vast majority of patients, management-wise, you could do it with an echocardiogram because we're not seeing these patients towards the end. Uh, not infrequently, we have to monitor them and follow them early on, infrequently, and then later on a little bit more frequently, putting together symptoms and imaging, right? So the beauty about echo is you can get a gradient non-invasively, which is probably better than any of the other non-invasive modalities. You know, MRI is second, but um, it has still, you know, aliasing thresholds, et cetera, that you have to deal with. Uh, the other, I mean, anatomically, yes, you can measure the valve better with the other two modalities than echocardiography. So it can give you the hemodynamics, the remodeling of the ventricle, because I look at hypertrophy, I look at diastolic function, I look at overall function in addition to the gradient and the valve area. And these are the measures, in addition to symptoms, these are the measures that you're going to follow to make a decision of when to intervene, right? Uh, the question is, when would you need an MRI? I tell you, most often, if I need a, if I need an imaging a second imaging modality, it will be an MRI as opposed to a CT. And the reason for it is, if there is a question about amyloidosis in this patient for whatever reason, we can we can address that. Uh, you can do even a stress test with vasodilator stress if you're concerned about coronary disease with it at the same time. It can give you hemodynamics. And in the patients with bicuspid aortic valve, now we're talking about the younger individual, this is a great modality that you could follow looking at the aorta and maybe one time echo, another time MRI to decrease the cost and take a look at that. CT, in my experience, is most often periprocedural. You know, I, we don't do a TEE for for the procedure itself. We will do a CT for the procedure, pre-TAVR evaluation. If there is, you know, we'll do it for coronary disease, everything else in addition to great measurements of what is needed for the for the intervention. I really agree with Bill, and I think that T1 mapping is the most important thing that MRI could give us in the future because Probably we don't have data yet, but T1 mapping will show exactly the moment that we have in the myocardium. And I don't think that, what do you think about that, Joe? No, I think so. I, I think that, you know, we, you know, in the MRI community can provide a different perspective to what the ventricular myopathy related to the valve disease. And, you know, there are insults. And that, as I mentioned, you know, when we have a therapy that is life saving, waiting for symptoms to pull the trigger uh, is something that is still, you know, is difficult to, you know, swallow. Although we know that the time of the clock also starts. I mean, there is prosthesis degeneration that we have to balance that. And the young population tower is not the answer for everyone. So, yes, I still think that, you know, MRI can help in these low flow, low gradients, uh, in understanding the myopathy and T1 mapping and ACV pre and post contrast can be another point as well to show that, you know, the ventricular myopathy starts way before the development of these symptoms. Pablo, that's a, that's a great idea for research to tell you the truth, particularly in the older individual where a bioprosthesis is, is at hand. 
I mean, you, I mean, Zhao mentioned that because, you know, you're replacing a valve with a valve that is, you know, that at some point in time, we're going to give you some trouble. So it depends where you have to balance that with, with how strong the data is and trying to help out symptoms, diastolic function, heart failure. We're not, I mean, we're talking about mostly heart failure symptoms here, right? Yes. But hospitalization and ultimately outcome. So, and whenever you, we're going to, whenever we're going back to the early, early question, whenever you're going to change the paradigm of how you're going to, you're going to treat these patients, we have to take a look at a longer term, you know, outlook beyond five, six years, seven years, something like this to, to, I mean, unless the changes are so dramatic, right? Yes, Bill. You didn't mention your in your talk about the the new flu rates uh, parameters that appear. Uh, I think a couple of months months ago in Jack from the the people from the Mass General, and it was validated in Quebec. What is your opinion about that, the the flow rate? Because it seems that it has some prognostic information. It does, and. Um you know flow rates will you know there's flow rates and there's a projection at a certain flow rate there are so many other parameters that are uh, harder to to put your finger on now from a changing our approach i think flow rates going to be important i think because it tells you something about contractility and also about the ventricular i mean valvular function so we have to wait and see a little bit. Okay. Bill, if I may just uh, also try to address, because you brought it up that point about the contractile reserve in the Tava patients, the paper by Ibero yes. um, that received, we actually were, were part of that um, with the Philippe. And that is intriguing. And actually, we have seen in different series too, more recent for Tava. And you know, it makes you wonder why in the world contractile reserve does not matter anymore. Yeah, and I think it, it has to do with the insult that Tava produces. It's so small, it's so elegant to go in and out that you know actually these ventricles do much better if you treat the afterload mismatch than regardless of the contractor reserve. Um, so I mean, it, it could be, it could be, but yet though, Joao, the prognosis is not the greatest. If you take a look, you understand what I mean? It's not like a a flat curve of great prognosis. Yes. <laughs> it's still going down. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, the, the corollary to your point is these people are sick. You may improve their symptoms, all right, but irrespective of the contractile reserve, they're not necessarily dying from their heart. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes, yes, yes. They're dying from and dying with. You know. Exactly, because from that, from these data, uh, the the factors that were involved in the prognosis are anemia, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Pulmonary hypertension. Yes. You know the other things that. So irrespective, if I have contractile reserve or if I don't, <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> it. It, it may be. It may be truly. It may be more operational in a little younger population where you have a cardiomyopathy like situation maybe with moderate as or a little worse as that if you unload things yeah. will get better their heart failure gets better etc cetera, etc cetera, and they have a better prognosis that, that I'm, I'm i'm leaning towards that very interesting Carlos. yes anybody has any question Yes, Pablo. Pablo, go ahead. First, Pablo. Go ahead, Pablo. Now, before starting, we, we were talking with Ricardo and Carlos uh, about uh, prosthetic valve failure, thrombus, and and panos. And we, we have. We, I, I like to to know uh, how how can you follow up this patient and. and when you use MRI to 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 follow this patient, you mean prosthetic patients, Pablo? In prosthetic patients, see. Bioprosthesis. Yes. Bioprosthesis. 
Radio, yes. Yes, biopsy. Yeah, surgical bioprosthesis. Actually, I think, Pablo, that CT is a much better. I mean, echo for sure um, is what is yes, going to yes, draw your call the gradients. But echo I think and CT, of course. Yeah, multiphasic CT is actually, boy, you get some beautiful images. And you can see whether there's panels, whether there's halt, where there's restricted <laughs> Uh, you can calculate on a mechanical prosthesis the angles of opening and compare to what the references should be. Uh, and actually, you can look, also look at the aorta. We had a beautiful case last week that uh, it was a bigger patient. So there was some PPM element to it. The acceleration time was a little bit shorter. Uh, but then the aorta was only 26 millimeters. So there was also some pressure recovery. Um, that was seen there. So, you know, I think all of the things along with the echocardiography, it's much better by CT, I think, than by MRI. Um, unless you're interested yeah, yeah. in the ventricular problem. I agree. Yeah. I think your screener is obviously echo and clinical, meaning yes. if you see some changes in gradients that you don't like, uh, obviously that's a trigger. Yes. If there is a clinical event of an embolic event or something like this, you're not going to do CTs on right and left on everybody, right? Yes. You're going to do it on some select patients. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the thrombus may, may not be hemodynamically significant, right? So we know that there are going to be some that we're going to miss. Bill, do you use uh, effectively this area in the prosthesis to uh, really point it out which is really obstructed or which is uh, only PPM? We do, we do effective orifice area, we do DVI, that's our okay. screener, uh, mm -hmm. because that's the simplification of the effective orifice area, and, and basically follow these parameters. Are you still so, using the parameters that you published in ASC uh, recommendation a long time ago about the yes, modification? they're still profile. the same. I think in a way they're <laughs> saying, I mean, the beauty, the beauty of the TAVR valves is they have the best hemodynamics of any valve we've ever seen. I agree. So, Bill, let, let me, let, can I ask a question then? Because this is so uh, fascinating to have the chance to ask the expert here. Um, so let me expand on that as well, because I completely agree with you. So in the air of TAVR, PPM is really, really small. I mean, we can even, you know, already pre-understand. I mean, it's this very small annulus or perhaps a small surgical prosthesis in valve in valve, right? Outside of that is really... So the thresholds that we have been looking for PPM have come from surgical uh, you know, data. And now we're putting the same thresholds cut points into uh, TAVR. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Should we use the projected, should we use the measured? Because of those inaccuracies, you know, a little bit of the LVOT here, now you have a PPM with a gradient of seven. I mean, gradient of seven. No, but, but remember though, uh, unfortunately we use PPM too loosely, okay? You cannot even talk about PPM unless you have a high gradient. Yes. Otherwise, we're dividing an effective orifice area, which can be completely normal, by an obese population. <laughs> right? True. So you end up you end up with coming numbers that don't make any sense. Yes. So PPM to start with has to be at least a velocity of three. So you said so that you have a gradient and said, mm, why am I having a gradient, right? <laughs> uh, so if your velocity is completely normal, well, we cannot talk about PPM unless, obviously, you know, the ventricle has no stroke volume. Yes, <laughs> I agree completely with Bill. I, I think so. I agree. Okay. Uh, Manuel, another question? Yes, the last question for sure. So when you, you, you have patient with any contraindication for CT, do you use any gating sequences for MRI, like 3D, 3D Cine imaging with navigator, or only use angiographic sequences for aortic, no? For aortic angiography. Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, the patient has contraindication for CT because of the iodine or something like that, right? So, yes, yeah, the yeah. sequence that I showed you before is a navigator gated. So it's gated by both breathing as well as EKG, and you can do this in diastole or in systole. In systole, is going to take a little bit longer because the interval is shorter. And it's a 3D whole heart, similar to what we use for the you know, bicuspid patients, aorta, and things like that, but it has to be gated.
um, and then we can do the measurement and use the software. Yeah, the, the problem is that here in Argentina, some some institute not have 3D machine or sequencing, no gating sequences. So we only use angiographic sequences, and it's not the same, no. But what you could do then in this case, one is the approximation is you do contiguous short axis slices. You take a three chamber and you take a coronal and you march it down without gaps. And then you go until all the way the LVOT. And you can see the LVOT, you know, pulsated just like what we measure on the CT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. O only use a uh, echo gradient in the seconds, no? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Carlos. I have a last question, if I can. Yes, Aldo, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, do you do you feel that 50% of EF is a good cutoff in order to decide the uh, ejection fraction is normal or the myocardium is affected or not in our TB or hypnosis? Or should be okay, this is a very, 50 percent Very important question. There's some recent data that uh, is bothersome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, the old uh, teaching is that don't worry about EF and aortic stenosis. If it is 50, 45, it will recover, it will be normal. Patient will have a good prognosis. Um, there's recent data published, I think, uh, in the last, within a year or two in uh, Jack Interventions, showing that the best prognosis in the EF of greater than 70% in the in aortic stenosis severe then is similar to above 60 below 60 a gradation of worsening outcome so it may tie with what joao is saying in the mri discoveries meaning that those ventricles besides afterload right and reduce shortening and re reduce GLS. Once the EF is low, or lowish, I would say, below 60, that the prognosis may not be as good because there may be some irreversible damage. Mm -hmm. So the EF may improve, but you may end up still with heart failure symptomatology or something else. I don't know. Meaning, uh, this is fertile for research, Aldo. And, uh, I think it's it's very interesting. It's against of what we were brought up thinking about. Yes, the EF may improve most often, right? Uh, if the aortic stenosis is severe and the gradient is high. But the question is, in that scenario, if EF is close to 50, let's say 55, high 40s, is there some irreversible damage also that impacts prognosis? The problem I have with these data, okay? is that these are all TAVR data. And with TAVR data, the age group is 70, 75. And you know, you know what their prognosis is like. <laughs> so that's the issue. So, yes. Do you have do you have any explanation why the different ventricular response in, in the same uh, grade of aortic stenosis? Well, let's see. The different ventricular responses for the same degree of aortic stenosis. Um, I'm assuming that everybody would have the normal ejection fraction, I yes, guess. Yes. Um, I think the different pathways might be related to how these ventricles presented to the TAVR or presented to the aortic valve intervention <laughs> and the other comorbidities. Um, you know, again, what the valve choice is, there are many factors, right? So we're just talking about prosthesis patient mismatch. If you have an obese patient, well, that is already in of itself a bad you know, insult to have. Uh, but if you put a small prosthesis, this patient, it, you want to treat severe to probably moderate fixed aortic stenosis unless the patient loses weight or something like that. Um, the, also, the damage that this patient would have from myocardial fibrosis, that hypertrophic response comes at a price of micro infarcts, right, that we show them the, on the MRI. And that might be a repercussion that these patients, as Dr. Zog just mentioned, might be the insult that will lead them to have continued heart failure. 
So why, despite having the same ejection fraction, a patient that received the same valve, we have a favorable course versus the other one, um, <laughs> there are many ways, uh, even the procedure itself, right? If, now we have done much better because it used to be paravalvulally, uh, but one has now a pacemaker and the other one does not have a pacemaker. That is also not, uh, you know, trivial, right? I mean, we know that if the patient develops a left bundle after TAVR, even with a preserved DF, that would have an unfavorable consequence down the road. Even if they are using now a pacemaker, it's not also um, a nuisance. So there are many facets uh, and many procedural and pre-procedural aspects. Oh, Ricardo? No, I, I completely think? agree with the, the, this approach. I think that there's too many things, but uh, probably if you take away all these uh, acquired things or the consequences, the, the main point should be fibrosis and the expansion of the interstitium. So uh, if you took away all these uh, accidental issues, uh, fibrosis is the the main way to know what uh, what will be happen with a patient after a replacement. Mm -hmm. I agree. Oh, Ricardo, I think we, we are on time. Okay, let's thank our visitors and uh, our uh, professors. Uh, and thank you very much to join us. Thank you very much to share your expertise with us, with the Federation people. And uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for having us here, uh, Ricardo and Carlos and, and all of you. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure being with you and, and interacting with you. And I want to thank also your physicians for attending. I know we don't see them, but hopefully that <laughs> was uh, helpful to them. We had more than 130. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. It's very humbling to see and have the interest in this topic. And I certainly look forward to coming back one day, you know, hopefully to Argentina so we can celebrate with some nice Malbecs. <laughs> we hope so, Joe. Hey, Joe. All right. Ricardo. Thank you. Luego. Thank you, Joao. And thank you, William. Hasta luego. <laughs> Hasta luego. <laughs> Bye. Gracias. Thank you. Buenas noches a todos. Pablo. Buenas noches. Buenas noches a todos.